reading this evening is from 1 Corinthians chapter 16 from verse 13. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be strong, do everything in love. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. I urge you, brothers, to submit to such as these and to everyone who joins in the work and labours at it. I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus and Archaicus arrived, because they have supplied what was lacking from you, for they refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. Come, O Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. This is God's word. And now here's Pastor Ian. Thank you, Mrs. West. Um, do you want to stand up quickly? Are you okay? If you've been sitting for a while, um, I'd hate you to sit and get too comfortable and start snoozing before it's time to hear from the Lord. Maybe greet someone you don't know, or is that too intimidating? Okay. Let's pray. We thank you for the way in which you have given yourself so freely to us, so sacrificially. Thank you for your devotion to us as your people. Thank you for the way that you have lavished your grace upon us and your love. Thank you for the way that you watch over us and the way that you nurture us and grow us in our relationship with you. We thank you that you've given us everything we need for life and for godliness. Thank you, you do not, that you do not call us to be that which you do not strengthen us to be, but you give us the necessary grace that we might serve you in a way that points people to the Lord Jesus Christ in a way that expresses our faith. So again, as we hear from you this evening, may your voice drown out all other voices in our minds. And may we leave you having been touched by Almighty God for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, believe it or not, this is the last in our Corinthians. So you can go to the book of Esther and do some forward reading. We're going to go through an Old Testament. You can't keep me out of the Old Testament very long. That means the associates are also going to have to get stuck into the Old Testament. But we're going to go back uh, and do a bit of Old Testament. Okay. When I was recently decided or recently decided to pick up golf again and I mean recently it's only in the last two years there was about a, a 10 year hiatus or even longer where I didn't really play much golf um, I should have just left it and just let that continue the way my golf is played at the moment I decided after watching some instruction videos on YouTube now YouTube is both good and bad if you go and you look for videos that tell you how you're supposed to play golf all that happens is you get on the golf course and you've got all these confusing thoughts running through your mind and Trevor has frequently said to me, stop watching videos and he's right, I should stop watching the videos but I can't help it, it's, it's my nature. I have a, a, a slight perfectionist tendency and so when I do something I want to try and do it 
perfectly, which of course is impossible. And so I try and get all the information I can so that I can apply that information. The problem is golf, I seem to be very poor at applying it. And so I subscribe to a golf website. I subscribed to a, a site just for a year that had a whole lot of instruction videos. And you start off and you go through, there's about 15 of them, and you're supposed to do the instruction, go out, and for the next week you go through all the practices, and then you go to the next one, and the next week you go through all the practices. I figured out it was going to take me weeks to do that, and who has the time to do that? Well, I didn't have the time to do that, so I'd go out and maybe do five minutes worth of it and think, okay, it's done. And of course, my golf didn't get better, it got worse. And uh, it was, I was struggling because I wasn't, and then I, uh, applying it, and then I'd go back to what I normally did and thought, oh, there's no point because none of this is helping. And the reason it wasn't helping is because there was no consistent application. Isn't the Christian life like that? Isn't it? We read the Word of God, we know what it says, we hear what it says, and our difficulty, as one of the questions indicated, is consistent application. Is to try and work out our salvation, as Paul writes to the Ephesians. To try and make sure that our faith is being expressed the way that we read it should be expressed. And there are times, I suspect, in your Christian life, if you're anything like me, that there are good weeks and there are bad months. We get it right, and things are going well, and we're consistent, and then something happens, and then something else happens, and, and then we fall back into bad habits, and, and, and we kind of start feeling guilty that we're not doing what we should do, and, and then we open up the Bible again, and we start reading again, and we get back into a disciplined kind of process, and things seem to go well, and then we slip into bad habits again. Isn't that true? Or am I unique in that? And what the Apostle Paul is trying to help us to get is that if we are going to live a life worth living, we have to develop structures in our lives that help us develop consistent patterns that we apply truth. One theologian said, you haven't learned the Word of God until you do the Word of God. So you might have all the knowledge stuffed in your head, but until that knowledge is applied, it's not knowledge. It's just facts stuffed in your head. And so it becomes really important in our walk that we cry out to God for grace to help us, to strengthen us, because we can't do this by ourselves, and that God, who is all-powerful, has given us, by the Holy Spirit, the necessary strength to be more consistent in our Christianity. So that when we get to the end of our lives, we can look back one day and say, yes, I can see not only my growth in my relationship with Christ, but I can see the fruitfulness of the many years I've labored to be faithful in how I've worked out my Christianity. We looked a bit of what that looked like last week. It's alert, it's firm, it's mature, it's strong, it's loving, it's courageous. This evening, I want to pick up on a few more things that I think Paul brings out here that are important for us to grasp if we are going to be consistent Christians. Secondly, last week was the importance of vigorous faith. This week, the importance of expressed faith. Verses 15 and 16. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. That statement is remarkable. Because what that statement communicates to me 
is that these people who were converted in Achaia and then established the church in Corinth weren't just converted and did nothing, but were converted and immediately, without there being any delay, got about serving Christ. And that is remarkable because sometimes there may be a gap between conversion and getting involved in service for Christ. But they immediately ensured that their faith wasn't just something that had happened in their head, but resulted in an acts of service. And as a result of that, the church is established and the church begins to serve each other and begins to serve the community and begins to grow as more and more people are added to its number. Because these first converts weren't just satisfied with being converts. In other words, as someone has written, church is no spectator sport. It's not a place where you sit in the sidelines And you watch on, and you cheer those who are engaged in serving God. But church is where all of us who are believers, according to the gifts that God has given us, and the grace that He bestows upon us, actively engage in using our gifts in the service of God in that church. Church is not for pew warmers. No place for them. Notice the word that he uses here. It's really important. And have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Devoted is an intensive form of the Greek emphasizing that service arose out of their initiative. They did not wait to be asked to serve. They simply got in in the matter of serving or offered themselves to serve in the church. I have sometimes had people come to me, of course not in this church, but come to me and said, why should I serve? Or what do you as a church have to offer me? And my question is not what do we have to offer you, but what do you have to offer us? by way of service. How are you going to get involved? What is your area of ministry that God has gifted you in? How are you using the gifts that God has given you? It is the ultimate insult to God not to use your gifts. That's to throw it back to him and say, I don't care. I'm not getting involved. William Barclay, on this verse, said, In the early church, willing and spontaneous service was the beginning of official office. A person became a leader of the church, not so much by any man-made appointments, as because their life and work marked them out as one whom all people must respect. All those who share the work and toil of the gospel command respect, not because they've been appointed by a man to an office, but because they are doing the work of Christ. This is to what you are called. Don't take my word for it. Take God's word for it. I've got a few scriptures. Ephesians 2 verse 10. For we are created as God's workmanship, created in Jesus Christ to do what? to do good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. Do you hear that? Paul, writing to the Ephesian church, is saying, God in eternity has created good works for you to do. Now get on and do them. James 2.14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, it does nothing about his physical needs. 
What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Do you hear that? That's not me saying that. But to claim to be a Christian, but to have no accompanying good works as the expression of that Christianity, James says, your faith is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. Now, James is not advocating a works-based salvation. What James is advocating is a works-expressed salvation. If I've been changed, the inevitable outcome of that change is that I serve. To withhold service is to have a faith that is defective. Philippians 2.12 Therefore, my dear friends, as you, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's not work out as to figure out your salvation, but that is to do the necessary works that accompany salvation. Now, in this church, obviously, some of our older members sitting here this evening have faithfully served over many years. They provide an incredible example to you who are younger. They've been engaged in all kinds of areas of service over a long period of time. And their faith has been worked out consistently in this area. And so they provide for us a model of what faith looks like. That's why it's so, so important to have older people and younger people together in a church service. Because if it's just young people, we have no examples. We have no models. We have no maturity. We have no way of seeing how our men and women who are so much further down the track than we are, have shown us what it looks like not only to grow, but to serve. And if you're younger here this evening, grab one of them. Seriously, grab one of them and say to them, will you meet up with me? I want to learn from you. I want to talk about how you've persevered over such a long time. I want to hear about the struggles you've experienced and how your faith has enabled you to keep going. I want you to tell me about how you served God when discouragement set in and you were despondent. How did you keep going? Our older people in this church are, in a sense, our most valuable because of the experience they bring. And what a testimony they are. I want to share with you. I don't know if this is a true story. So you might go and Google it, although I don't like using Google, but you can go and Google and find out for yourself. I've heard different versions of it, so it's probably not true. It's probably anecdotal, and maybe it's been changed a bit, but I'm going to tell it anyway. So I'm, not, not, I'm, I'm putting a disclaimer up front. Legend has it that a missionary was lost at sea and was by chance washed up out of the sea on the edge of a remote native village. Half dead from starvation, exposure, and seawater, he was found by the people of the village and was nursed back to full health. Subsequently, he lived amongst these people for 20 years. During the whole of that time, he confessed no faith. He uttered no songs. He preached no sermons. He neither read nor recited any scripture. He made no personal faith claim. But when people were sick, he attended them, sitting long into the night. When people were hungry, he gave them food. When people were lonely, he was the source of company. 
He taught the ignorant. He was a source of enlightenment to those who were more knowledgeable. He always took the side of those who had been wrong. There was not a single human condition with which he did not identify. After 20 years had passed, missionaries came from the sea to the village and began talking to the people about a man called Jesus. And after hearing of Jesus, the natives insisted that he lived among them for the past 20 years. Come, we will introduce you to the man about whom you have been speaking. Missionaries were led to a hut, and there they found their long-lost fellow missionary who they thought was dead. Now, whether that's true or not, do you get the point? I don't know if it's true. But find some spiritual mentors. Find someone who's willing to disciple you. Offer yourself for service. There's so many areas to serve in the church. Don't ask for a position of leadership. Start with a position of fellowship. But work out your salvation. Faithful service precedes leadership. No one can expect to begin by leading. In fact, sometimes we elevate people to leadership too quickly. Some of you may have been listening to that podcast from Mars Hill, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. And one of the, the, the facts that come out of the, the problems that occurred with Mark Driscoll, and I'm not here to, to knock him. Please don't misunderstand me. But one of the, the realities that came out of that is that he was just too young to start pastoring a church. I think he was 26. And he hadn't matured in his faith. And as a result of the position of leadership he was given and had and came in too early, it created all kinds of problems. He became proud and arrogant, caused all kinds of problems in the church through his attitude. He needed to be under someone long before he ever took a position of leadership. So don't be put off if you're not asked to be a leader. Be willing to serve as a follower. In turn, then, this ought to result in willing submission to those who are leaders and live godly. Listen to what he says. I'm not putting words in Paul's mouth. Verse 16, as soon as I find it. I urge you, brothers, verse 16, to submit to such as these and to everyone who joins in the work and labors as why do we struggle so much with submission to leaders? But here the Apostle Paul is advocating that when we are engaged in service as a church, there is a submission process that is necessary. We submit to those leaders, those godly leaders God has established in the church. This same principle comes out in Hebrews Chapter 13, verse 17. Let me read the verses in case you think I'm making it up. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. There's an important biblical principle that we are to learn as we grow up, particularly as young Christians, and that is the principle of learning what it means to submit to those whom God has placed as leaders over us. Now, that doesn't mean you submit to ungodliness. Please don't misunderstand me. If you have leaders that are acting in ungodly, unspiritual, non-Christian ways, you shouldn't be submitting to them. But those whom God has put over you who are seeking to live in godly ways, not perfectly, but godly ways, and show that we need to learn what it means to submit to our leaders. Now, Paul is writing this. Why? What's happening in the Corinthian church? There's... Division. There's division. And so while there's division in that church, Paul is saying to them, remember, submit to your leaders. Boy, that's hard. One of the commentators put it like this. 
They should renounce their own preferences and in humility and love regard others better than themselves, Philippians 2, 3. Thus, Paul urges the Corinthians to be in subjection to their leaders who diligently serve the members of the Christian community. The writer of the epistle to Hebrews also urges these readers to obey their leaders and to submit to their authority. Once we learn what submission means, then we will be put in a position where we are ready to leave. leave. But until we've learned what it means to submit, it's premature to be put into a position of leadership. Can I give a personal example? I don't like giving personal examples because I don't in any sense want to try and elevate myself. I'm full of flaws, I'm imperfect. I haven't always got this right. I've got this wrong at times. So, so I, I don't want to set myself up as, as the, the perfect person. When I was a student pastor at the church I was at, Parkhurst Baptist, I was hoping to go to college in 1990. That's a long time ago. And in the process of wanting to go and study for full-time ministry, I met with the leadership, the elders of the church at Parkhurst. And they sat me down and they said to me, Ian, we think that you're not quite ready to go to college yet. We think you need to delay going to college. There are things that need to be rounded in you before we think you should be going there. My initial reaction was to pot with you. I'm going to apply and go in spite of what you're saying to me. I went to the principal of the college, and I sat down with him, and I said, what do I do, Rex? I really feel God's call upon me. What do you suggest? He said to me, Ian, I know at least three or four churches in the area who will gladly take you, who will gladly send you, but I'm telling you, you go back and you submit. That was one of the hardest decisions I made. But I'm so grateful I did. That extra year made all the difference. And as hard as it was for me to submit to their leadership, in hindsight, they were right. And I was not. And the benefits of what that year did for me, we got to the end of the year and they came back to me and they said, we're 100% behind you. We've seen the kind of growth we were looking for. Submit to your leaders. Not easy. Thirdly, the importance of mutual encouragement. Look at verses 17 to 20. I'm going to go through this quite quickly. The importance of mutual encouragement. I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus arrived. Boy, what names. Imagine, that's a bit of a mouthful calling them. Because they have supplied what was lacking from you. Now hear this. For they refresh my spirit and yours also. Aren't those beautiful words? They're lovely, aren't they? Because here are a group of people who have come from Corinth. They've probably brought some correspondence from what's going on in the church from Corinth to Paul, which is why he's now responding in writing this letter. And he's going to take that letter and say, you take this back to Corinth, that they can read the letter that I'm compiling. But when they come, there is Paul. Who knows what he's experiencing and going through at that particular point in his life. But they get alongside Paul, and they refresh his spirit. They encourage him. They get alongside him. They revive his spirit, if I can put it like that. They minister to him who is experiencing difficulties. And the reality of this, you see, the principle that lies behind this is no Christian, no matter how strong they are, no matter how mature they are, is a one-man island. We need each other. Boy, we need each other. We need mutual encouragement. 
through many trials and tribulations we must go through before we enter into the kingdom of God. And no matter how spiritual people may appear, all people go through difficult times. All people struggle at times spiritually. And those who are sensitive to the needs of others will get alongside those who are struggling for whatever reason they're struggling. It may not just be a spiritual struggle. It may be a financial. It may be emotional. It may be related to their job. It may be physical. But one thing we do as believers is we get alongside one another and we encourage one another. And we all need encouragement. That's why the author to the Hebrews writes and says, do not neglect the meeting together of the body of Christ. That's why, one of the reasons why we gather. So that we can encourage one another. Let me read the text, Hebrews 10, 25. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching, as the second coming of Christ nears, all the more should we be encouraging one another. In other words, my dear friends, you and I should be on the lookout for those who are struggling. And we should be getting alongside those who are going through hard times, praying with them, listening to them, crying with them, bearing with them their burdens, helping where we can in practical ways because we need each other. And God has created us as a community who are bound to each other by the precious blood of Jesus. Not only comes out in these three men who encouraged them, but mutual encouragement was evidence in the various churches sending their greeting so that it wasn't just this one church, but various churches sending their greetings to Paul to encourage him. We are not alone in our walk. There are other churches around in this area who are also engaged in the same work that we are engaged in. And seeing them engaged in the work that we are should provide encouragement to us that we are not alone. There's some really good churches in this area. There are. Do we pray for them? Do we ask God's blessing upon them? Or do we become so self-absorbed that we're too scared that we might lose members to other churches that are going well instead of praying that God continue to bless them and cause the ministry they have to thrive, that we might be a source of encouragement to them in their walk? Finally, this encouragement is seen in the way they greeted each other. You see that. For they refresh my spirit and yours also, such men deserve. The church in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord. And so does the church that meets at their house. So there's various churches now greeting and encouraging Paul. Um, I was glad, and then he says, uh, sorry, uh, I urge you brothers to, yeah, uh, lacking, for, oh, yeah, I'm getting lost here. All the brothers here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. That in those days was not a kiss as a physical kiss, but it was a way of expressing mutual encouragement through some kind of physical embrace. Whether or not that was a hug, whether or not that was a warm embrace, putting your arm around someone else, they were known for that kind of mutual physical encouragement. Sometimes when people are downhearted and are struggling in their faith, how wonderfully encouraging to go and put your arm around them and encourage them in their faith. It's a warm handshake, if I can put it like that. A warm greeting. 
not just the cold-hearted kind of passing by and by. There was mutual affection, a oneness in stateness, a oneness in identity across the board. They were all in this together, and they loved each other. And that love spilled over into how they mutually greeted one another. The modern equivalent, perhaps, is a warm embrace, a handshake. getting along with each other and providing encouragement. Perhaps you are here this evening as one who so desperately needs a word of encouragement. And maybe someone else who is traveling well might be sensitive enough to recognize that and encourage you. Maybe it's taking you out for a cup of coffee, maybe for a meal, just to encourage, just to get alongside you and say, you know, Kathy, we really appreciate you. Thanks for all the work you do as our children's worker. We just want to bless you with the lunch. or a new roof in your bedroom that's collapsed. Maybe it's to a deacon, to Trevor, our treasurer, who works so tirelessly behind the scenes, coming alongside him and saying, Trevor, thanks for the work you do. You know how much work is involved in that? It's a lot of work. Maybe it's getting alongside someone who comes and cleans the church no one else knows about him. Looking on the list and getting alongside them and saying, we just want to tell you, thanks so much for the work you put in behind the scenes and cleaning the church. Maybe it's inviting one of our single people around for a meal to your home. Saying, we want to include you in our family. Come and be part of us. There's so many ways to encourage, aren't there? What a blessing it is when we encourage one another. And then finally, very quickly, the importance of considering the future. Two things very quickly. One is a curse. Not putting words in his mouth. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. Whew, that's strong words, don't you think? If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on them. I wouldn't say that. But here is the Apostle Paul writing to this Corinthian church where there are factions and fighting going on. And he says to them, if you don't love the Lord, and that love is not being expressed mutually together as a congregation, then, then a curse be on you. Whew. I wouldn't dare say that. But he said it. You see, because here's the thing. If we love Jesus, we love each other. And love covers over a multitude of sins. And love expresses itself through the way in which we interact with one another, the way we speak to one another, the attitudes we have towards one another. Why? Because Jesus has loved you like that. You and I are not lovely to Jesus. We're sinners. We polluted from head to toe with sin. And yet, how does Jesus love us? For God demonstrates his love in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Love one another as 
I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciple. No wonder he says that. And then the second is the hope in Christ's second coming. Come, O Lord. That literally is the word, two words in the Greek, marana and tha. And put together, maranatha. We all know the word. Come, Lord Jesus, expressed again in Revelation. Here is Paul saying, yes, we want Jesus to come. We're looking forward to his second coming. We never lose sight of his second coming. We don't get so engaged in the things of this world that we lose sight of the fact that Jesus is coming again. And we are geared towards that reality. And it is that reality that drives us motivates us, and causes us to get on with the business of serving Christ. The danger is getting distracted, as I said this morning. You can listen to this morning's sermon because that was on this, that we build up treasure in heaven. And the treasure that we build up, that's where our heart is oriented. Seek first, in, in Matthew 6, 31, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be So we seek God's kingdom. And if there was ever a time to cry out, come Lord Jesus, it's now, isn't it? The hope that we have in the second coming of Christ. I want to close by just quoting or referring to Chrysostom, the ancient church father. It's a beautiful example of Christian courage in the face of adversity and looking forward to the home to which he was going. When he stood before the Roman emperor, he was threatened with banishment if he still remained a Christian. Chrysostom replied, you cannot, for the world is my father's house. You cannot banish me, but I will slay you, said the emperor. No, but you cannot, said the Noble champion of the faith again. For my life is hid with Christ and God. I will take away your treasures. No, but you cannot, was the retort. In the first place, I have nothing you know anything about. My treasures in heaven and my heart is there. But I will drive you away from man and you shall have no friend left. No, that you cannot once more, said the faith wardeness, for I have a friend in heaven whom you shall not separate me from. I defy you. There is nothing you can do to hurt me. There was a man whose focus was on heaven. Where is your energy directed towards? Where is mine directed towards? Do we sometimes lose sight of the place to where we are headed that Christ is preparing for all who love him? Do we sometimes lose sight of the reality that the only thing that's going to be of any value one day is the treasure we've accumulated in heaven? And that's, as I said to the morning service, for those who have served God for a long time, boy, you've got a good treasure trove waiting for you. One day you'll enter into the presence of God and he will look at you and say, well done. But those of you who are younger, you've got your life that stretches ahead of you. Can I encourage you? Don't lose sight of the final destination. Heaven is where you're headed. That's what matters. Be spent for the glory of God. For one day you will reap an eternal reward that will never perish, spoil, or fade. Where moths cannot eat, where rust cannot decay, where thieves cannot break in and steal. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would burn it into the depths of our being. Help us to be Christians who are real Christians, not by what we say, but by what we do.
orientate our lives so on the Lord Jesus Christ that he, his life flows in and through us. That whenever you take us to be with you, whether through your second coming or whether through the doors of death, that as long as you give us strength till our very last breath, we will be engaged in serving you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. And just stand.